We truly don't know how much we care for someone until they are gone. Minute by minute, month after month, those people are in our life until they are basically seen as white noise. Once they are gone, that is when we truly learn how much that person meant to us. My name is Jeff, aka G Chris. Welcome to another installment of Black Sight Files from Unsolved Mysteries. In this installment, we will be hearing about the case of Rogers Kane. This case first aired on the November 30th, 1988 episode of Unsolved Mysteries. This case reminds me so much of the George Owens case that originally aired on the August 19th, 1992 episode of Unsolved Mysteries. It's quite sad that it's been almost 40 years we can find and bomb criminals into oblivion, but we cannot find the remains of a person whose family greatly miss him. I just want us to say thank you to everyone who has taken the time to vote in the most recent poll for the thumbnail for this video. You guys get to choose the, the direction that this video takes when it comes to the uh, thumbnail that we used. As always, I, I pick four images, four basically because that's all YouTube allows us to do so, but you know, still four. We actually had a total of nine, nine votes, which I wanna say thank you. That means a lot to me. Thank you to everybody who has taken the time to vote. Uh, the four images was originally, uh, the first one is the default image that I always, you know, kind of use with a different background possibly. We then have Rod, the Rogers Kane introduction image at 89%. We had Rogers Kane calling his neighbor. And then we have Robert Stack. And I'm guessing that the person, that the ninth voter actually voted for Robert Stack because like I said, until I just started recording this, this is actually a landslide. It was 100% for Rogers Kane's, uh, his introduction image. but. I do want to say thank you to everybody who has taken the time to vote. It is your vote that determines the outcome of, you know, this show about the uh, thumbnail and everything. So I just want to say thank you. You guys are awesome. With that said, let's switch back. Well, let's do this and then we're going to do this. Now, this is something new I'm kind of experimenting on. Uh, this is just going to give a quick breakdown before... I uh, start the show basically. So basically, case information: the name is the the person's name was or is or was Rogers Kane. He was sixty year, one years old when he went missing in nineteen eighty six. As of today, October sixteenth or sorry, October nineteenth, two thousand twenty four, he would have been a hundred years old. The location where he went missing was Los Angeles, California. The, this case is classified as a missing persons case. This case first, or this case is available on YouTube. You can find it in season one, episode 10. This is case number four. And if you were actually one of the lucky people that got to see this on NBC back in the day, this case originally aired on the uh, November 30th, 1988 episode. But with that said and out of the way, as always, wait, wrong one. As always, if you like what you watch, which I hope that you are, feel free to click that subscribe button and you'll be alerted when I release new content. I tend to do uh, Unsolved Mysteries, Transformers content, and once in a while I'll do a react. But yeah, that is about it. So when we return... Uh, with the start of the show, it will be, you know, the case viewing, and that will happen right after these commercials from the 1970s. We've created some very special people at First Federal Savings. These people, whose identities remain a secret, check on our teller courtesy by performing actual transactions at our teller windows. Every month, they check every First Federal branch to make sure you'll find a smile at every window. First Federal Savings. We want to give you the best service in town. First Federal Savings of Santa Monica offices throughout the Southland. Up next, we have the case viewing of Rogers Kane. Uh, yeah, this is actually a case, like I said, that is kind of sad to me because of the fact that uh, we don't know what happened to Rogers. 
it's believed that he could have had a medical condition and that it uh, really uh, that that impacted him basically. So if you are new to this series, basically this is where I'm going to go to the Unsolved Mysteries wiki, and I will have the computer read to us the uh, basically read to us the case, and then I will give you my thoughts once you know it's done reading. Now, just so you know, uh, basically, sometimes this program is not the best. This is actually a built-in uh, reader program that is built into uh, Microsoft Edge. But for some reason, even though this is actually part of the browser, it does not always operate the way it should. So just so you know, I may have to kind of stop. And it, like it'll jump from spot to spot sometimes. And in some cases, it may not even work properly at all, which is kind of sad because this, this is actually part of the browser itself. Okay, so we have Rogers Kane. Real name is Rogers Kane. No known nicknames. The location was Los Angeles, California, and the date was February 18th, 1986. Wait, did I say February 18th, 1986, or did I just say? I just said missing since 80, 1986. Okay, so uh, let me scroll down. Uh, his occupation was that he was a parks and recreation department worker. He was born on October 12th, 1924. He was five foot seven, 165 pounds. He was widowed, and he is an African American male with black hair and brown eyes. Okay, so this is actually it looks like it's going to be a quick case. So we will see uh, how it goes, but let's continue on, shall we? So, uh Let's do this down to here. Let's hope it works. You know, let's hope it works. Read aloud. And it's acting up, I think. So let's just see. Let's just see. Rogis Kane on unsolved.com. Really? Like I said, it literally jumps the entire case. How sad is that? Okay, let's just try it one more time. Let's just, let's just leave out where it says details. Let's just... Rogis Kane had yeah. always hoped to create a better life for his seven children. In 1908, he moved from Mississippi to Los Angeles, California, and was able to give his children advantages that he never had. His children stated that he was always a loving, caring father to them. By 1986, Rogis was 62 and worked for the Department of Parks and Recreation. However, on the afternoon of February 18, 1986, he left his home, telling his sister that he was going to a hardware store. He never returned. Since his disappearance, several clues have surfaced to suggest that he is still alive. Okay, so uh, I pause it real quickly so I can talk uh, about this. I think any, any, any parent who truly loves their child or their children uh, that they're going to do anything possible to make sure that their kid, their their children have have like a fulfilled life. I, I would think differently if they literally he just said, "Well, he fed them, he clothed them, that was it." But they actually made it sound like that he literally cares about his children. So I can I respect him more for that. Like I said, any parent worth their weight will do anything possible to make sure that their children is basically taken care of. Okay, let's see if this how this goes. Come on. Please. Rogist Kane on unsolved.com. Wow. Rogist Wow, apparently it's only gonna work that little bit. It only works that little bit. Holy fucking shit. Microsoft fix your stuff, dude. Like this is your program. How is it that oh my god, seriously, seriously. Okay, let's try it. Let's uh uh let's see here. Since his disappearance, several clues have surfaced to suggest that he is still alive. On February 19th, he called a neighbor and told her that he was not feeling well and could not go to work. When he did not come home, his family called the police. They also contacted hospitals and other relatives. Two days later, a private security company in an affluent neighborhood spotted a man who they believed to be Rogist. The man appeared confused and gave the officers a phone number that belonged to his sister, Teresa. 
However, when Teresa came to pick up her brother, he again disappeared. Okay, so the one thing I'm kind of confused about is he had, it sounded like he had his sister, he had his children. Why would he call the neighbor to let them know that he was not going to work? Unless possibly if the neighbor was like his boss or something, like they lived next door to each other. I, I just feel it's kind of weird that it was his neighbor he reached out to and not his family. Now, the theory is that he may have had like a mental impairment, like a stroke. So that could be why he may have reached out to the neighbor. Like maybe he had the stroke prior to disappearing uh, or, or even prior to later that day. Like he had a stroke while at home. And for some reason he, uh, he contacted his neighbor instead, because like I said, if it was me, I would, you know, nothing against my neighbors, you know, I don't know them, but if I knew my neighbors, even though I, you know, if I knew my neighbors, I'm pretty sure I liked them, but I think I'd rather tell my family that I'm not feeling well, you know, it, it just doesn't make sense that he would reach out to his uh, neighbor instead. Okay, so let's do this down to here and see how this goes. One month later, Rojas' car was found parked on a busy street 22 miles from his home. All of his papers, his GI Bill, the deed to his property, his insurance policies, his glasses, and his false teeth were all in his car. There were also pieces of paper that had his daughter's phone number written several times. His family believes that he was trying to remember her number. At the gas station next to his abandoned car, authorities learned that Rogist had talked to a mechanic on the day after he disappeared. The mechanic said that he repaired parts of Rogist's car and Rogist paid him in cash. The mechanic said that Rogist was slurring his speech and walking oddly. He last saw Rogist walking down the street away from the gas station. A uh, gas station. For some reason, the program never finishes that last word. 99% of the time, it's, it's gas station. Uh, yeah, it sounds like, we're going to find out here, it sounds like he, the poor guy had a stroke, which is sad because sometimes we don't realize, you know, it, it until it happens. Authorities and Roja's family believe that he may have suffered a stroke and is suffering from memory loss. Authorities discovered that Roja's telephone credit card had been used several times since he was seen by the security company. The calls made on Roja's card were traced. All of them were numbers from help wanted ads in a local newspaper. It is believed that when he became lost, Roja had the need to find work so that he could get money. Although he was memory impaired, he still realized that he needed money and knew he had to call places to find work. Authorities and his family believe that he was picked up by law enforcement or a paramedic and transported to a hospital for medical treatment as a John Doe. They hope that he is still being taken care of somewhere. However, no evidence has been found to suggest if he is still alive two years later. Uh, two years later. Two years, oh, come on. Two years later. With that said, when was the last time anybody can re recall even uh, needing to buy a telephone credit card? Now, back in like the early 2000s, I think they were known as long distance cards, but I never heard them referred to as a telephone credit card. Oh, sorry, telephone credit card. I never heard of them. Wait, why does it do the whole word? Oh, there it goes. Uh, I never heard them referred to as that. But do, do you guys remember the old days? when you literally would have to call collect and and you would hope that the person would actually, who's, you know, answering would be uh, like, I, yeah, I accept the call. Nowadays we could just call across the world if we want, since everything, everybody basically has like a cell phone nowadays. It, it, it's, a, it, it's kind of weird how much things have changed since 1986. Okay, so uh, suspects foul play was not suspected in his disappearance. No, I, I don't think I don't think he met, uh, 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 and like he was. I don't I don't think there was foul play. I think what happened was like they said the poor guy had a stroke. He was most likely picked up under as a John Doe, and he most likely lived out the rest of his life, however long it was, 
in some sort of assisted living uh, situation. Extra notes. The seg this segment originally ran on the November 30th, 1988 episode. Rogers is the father of former NFL player Lynn Kane, who was interviewed for the segment. He is also the grandfather of rapper Will I Am. Results unsolved. When the story first aired, several viewers called claiming that a man living in their Topeka, Kansas neighborhood named Elmer Jackson might have been Rogers. Now, I've been calling him Rogers. I think the computer called him Rogers. I, I, I just call him Rogers, though. Uh, the viewers noted that Jackson did not have any dentures and had a scar on his body that matched Rogers. Unfortunately, he disappeared before the police could question him. Within days, Rogers' son, Lynn, flew to Topeka to aid uh, police in the search. They have since learned that he lived in Topeka for about a year after... A truck driver brought him there. He had apparently worked several jobs, including as a bricklayer. Lynn and the police canvassed the neighborhood where Rogers apparently lived, but they were unsuccessful. Rogers was declared legally dead in 1995. Sadly, he has never been found. Rogers' siblings, Teresa, Marguerite, Clarence, Curtis, and Roland, have since passed away in uh, Roland's obituary. Rogers is listed as having predeceased pre him. So uh, the family actually believes that, that Rogers has passed away, which is sad. Uh, yeah, so it sounds like that, you know, he has family. He still has family, apparently, who cares enough for him. It's nice that they're trying to keep his memory alive and keep looking for him. The one thing that I would fear, ladies and gentlemen, is if I disappeared and nobody looked for me, you know, and and basically that could happen because now I'm basically the only one left in my family, you know, but it's like, it's like, what well, I know this is going to be a weird, uh, weird thing, weird, uh, thing uh, like weird speech that somebody said but i'm reminded of what freddy krueger once said i know i know we're going weird with this one dying is one thing but being forgotten now that is a bitch <laughs> but yeah uh but i i said i cannot imagine what would be like being forgotten that, that that would scare me it, it does scare me Up next, we have what I consider to be one of, uh, it's one of the parts I love to do for this series. I love to go to the find a grave to see if there's been any final information, because sometimes the information that is on the Unsolved Mysteries wiki is not always on, or what's uh, find on the find a grave is not always at the wiki. So let's see what we have here. They may actually have some other information that was not mentioned here. Okay, so this is the find a grave. This is a kind of like a website of you know people who have died. You can find their locate, you know, like where their final resting place is. Uh, so basically, we have Ro uh, Roger Kane. He was actually a veteran. I did not realize that he was a veteran. He was born October twelfth, nineteen twenty-three, in Pearl River County, Mississippi, USA. Oh my god. There's actually a professional wrestler that I loved back in the 90s. He was named, his name was Ahmed Johnson. He was actually, his character was actually from Pearl River, Mississippi. Anyway. And his, uh, his finishing move was the Pearl River Plunge. Oh, God, I miss the 90s. But anyway, date of death. They, ha they have his date of death listed as February 19th, 1993. He was... Age 69. Uh, the location was Los Angeles County, California, USA. Uh, Sen Cenotaph? Cenotaph is a marker within a cemetery placed in honor of a person whose remains are elsewhere. It may also be the original marker for someone who has since been reinterred elsewhere. I did not even know that that was a word. Location was or is Los Angeles National Cemetery, 
Los Angeles County, California, USA. The plot is ME0B10. Okay, and it looks like he served in World War II. He was uh, uh, must be Sergeant One or S One. It could be Sergeant First Class, possibly U.S. Navy. Ooh, hold on. Let me zoom in. Let me zoom in. I didn't realize it was that small. Sorry, guys. Parents: uh, Clarence Rogers K Rogers Kane, nineteen hundred to nineteen eighty two, and Nancy Ackler Page, nineteen o three to nineteen eighty. Wow, his mom and dad. Died in the same year. Oh, that's sad. Uh, siblings. We had Margaret Kane Jackson, 1922 to 2007. Curtis Leroy Kane, 1925 to 2004. And Roland Clifford Kane, 2000, uh, 1994 to 2011. He had a half-sibling, Charles Ray Page, from 1940 to 1957. Oh, the poor guy was only 17 years old. Okay, let's see. Do we have any... Let's see what all the pictures we have. We have the picture that I actually... That was actually the winner for the thumbnail. So, like I said, congratulations to everyone who voted once again. But this is that picture. We have the... Uh, in memory, you know, the, 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 the cinegraph, I think that's what it's called. Uh, basically, it says the same thing I already read. Uh, Sergeant First Class, U.S. Navy, World War II, and then his date of birth and date of death. And then the kind of like where he is in the, the, the cenograph is. <sighs> okay, so that is about it for that. Well, stay tuned, and after these commercials... I will be right back with uh, my final thoughts. Shirley, this is the last straw. It is, huh? Yeah, a two-day trip, and you're packing enough for a two-week cruise. Oh, Jack. Come on, look. Two antiperspirants. Why do we need two? Come on, Jack. You know I can't go anywhere without my secret roll-on. <laughs> secret, secret. We're taking my spray. Can't you use that? Oh, no. See, nothing beats my secret roll-on for stopping wetness. Not even your He-Man spray. That's why I always use it. You mean to tell me that secret roll-on is that strong? You betcha. It really helps keep me dry. Okay. Okay, if it's that strong, let's both use it. No. No? Secret's made for women. It smells pretty, see? Mm, that does smell mm, nice. And it doesn't make me smell like one of the boys. Yeah, but that's okay. Huh? Well, we can both use it as long as it's strong. Forget it, Jack. <laughs> Secret roll-on, strong enough for a man, but made for a woman. Hey, you know something? What's that, Jack? If your secret keeps you looking this good, I'm glad you're keeping it for yourself. I said it in the beginning of this video, and I'll say it again. It is, it's sad that we, we can locate a, a criminal around this world, you know, around our little pearl of a planet. And we can literally launch a missile and hit that person Dead, dead, dead aim, right, right, bam. But we cannot find one of our own citizens who has disappeared. You know, to me, that always, that, that always just rubs me the wrong way. You would think that we should be able to find our missing citizens, but sometimes it just doesn't happen. And that's sad. That's sad. I feel bad. I feel bad because apparently this guy loved his family and, and it's evident his family loved him. It's sad when we lose somebody and we don't know what happened to them. I think that, I think if Rod just passed away from like, you know, the stroke in with his family there, I think it would be one thing because the family would be able to have their closure. They would be able to have their closure and they would have that physical location to know where their loved one is. However, when somebody goes missing and they're never found, it, it just constantly kind of eats at that person or the family it eats at them because of the fact that they will never be able to be reunited all of uh rogers all of his uh brother his siblings are are gone all of them are gone so basically it is up to like uh grandchildren and great-grandchildren to uh you know to keep his memory alive 
And do I do I think this this video is going to solve the case? No, I don't. I don't. But what I do hope is that one of these days somebody may click on this video because of the name and and somebody could click and be like, "You know what? I served as a nurse or a doctor in that in a hospital." And I think, you know, there could have been somebody who could have been that person and it could get the whole ball rolling. You know, that's what I want. I, I just want to keep these cases that have not been solved alive. You know, that's basically what I would like, you know, like to happen. Well, that is it, ladies and gentlemen. I hope you have enjoyed this video. It's a rather sad case, but, you know, I hope you still like this video, though. Um, next installment. Now, next installment, it's going to be in a few weeks because up next, we are done with we are done with episode uh, season one, episode 10. We this is it, ladies and gentlemen. So after this uh, installment, it will be the review of season one, episode 10, where I'll, where I'll give you my overall thoughts of each case along with uh the uh along with you know my you know my thoughts you know but anyway it's basically going to be a, an a review basically however next episode so episode season one episode 11 we have a truly truly tragic case ladies and gentlemen uh the next installment case installment it will be the case of Jenny Pratt. Uh, Jenny Pratt was a victim of a heinous crime. It is believed that her boyfriend uh, knows more than what he is hiding, and I believe that he does know what happened, what who the people were that assaulted Jenny Pratt. Uh, we will find out about that in a couple weeks, but that you know, but that will be in November, and like I said, so we will be having the uh my review of season one episode 10 with i think it'll be possibly next week or the week after i gotta check out my schedule and update it and everything to reflect you know that i just done, got done with this you know but that is it ladies and gentlemen i do want to say thank you to everyone who has let's see here there we go there we go who has taken the time to watch this video and as always if you like what you watch feel free to click that subscribe button click the like click the bell you will be alerted when i release more unsolved mysteries content and i am going to bounce my name is jeff aka jeekers wishing all the greatest of days and st uh, stay you know take it easy everybody peace out think about it Every time you mix a drink, two-thirds of what goes into your glass is mixer. That's the two-thirds that will make or break the taste. Maybe that's the reason more people mix with Canada Dry than any other brand. Canada Dry Club Soda has pinpoint carbonation for long-lasting bubbles. Canada Dry Tonic Water has a taste that's distinctively smooth. Think about it. Two-thirds of your drink is mixer. So make your mixer Canada Dry.